Greetings one and all, this is Lloyd Brown and welcome social media family to my vlog. The second part of my vlog and I think I'm going to call the series Being Lloyd Brown. I know it's kind of overused and what have you but it just encapsulates what it is about being Lloyd Brown because people see one side People don't see the other side. Some people are fiercely private. Some people are fiercely revealing as to themselves and who they are and what makes them the people that they are. So I want to thank you for watching, if you're watching right now or if you're catching up. But um, this episode is going to consist of my childhood and my experiences as a child and how reggae music, in fact music, served as my vocation. Now I was born in 1964 in the Mother's Hospital in Clapton. East London, but I was brought up in Tottenham and I lived in Tottenham with my mum, my dad, my brother and my sister. And my mum being a homemaker and a hard worker and my dad being a provider and being a hard worker. A story that my mum and dad used to tell me was that when I was born, they literally had to, well, my dad in particular, he literally had his push bike in one hand and the pram with me in it in the other, in the driving snow, going to work bringing me to my, well, to the childminders before he rode his bike to work. And that story is not exclusive to me. There's many, many Caribbean households whose parents done exactly the same thing. But I'm just saying what I'm saying to bring uniformity to the thing. You know what I mean? Because our parents, the Windrush generation, worked damn hard and contributed so much in their work and I remember as a form of relaxation my my father would turn on the gram and play secular music on a Saturday and play gospel music on a Sunday and sometimes relatives would come round and it, it was a house of joy. It was a house of joy. It was filled with music, filled with love, filled with food. My mum would be in the kitchen cooking a pot of soup on a weekend and it was, it was a joy. It was a joy. It was, it was, it was great to be alive them time that, you know, and as a youngster, listening to music and not having any idea as to how music would be a driving force, a factor that will be front and center in my life up to this day. And two songs basically confirmed that for me growing up. One was Otis Red in These Arms of Mine. The next was Wonderful World, Beautiful People by Jimmy Cliff. I've cited these songs in many interviews I've had. And with that, it was just a done deal. Music was gonna be a part of my life. Went to school singing, sang in class.
But it wasn't until I went to Jamaica in 1977 that it was really, really confirmed to me. Because at that time, Bob Marley's Exodus was the album. Elvis Presley had passed. Maria Callas had passed. Mark Boland from T-Rex had passed as well that same year. And the ironic thing was that Bob Marley was in exile in the UK when I went to Jamaica. And of all the songs that was on the Exodus album, it was the song Guiltiness that touched me the most. That song had me in tears because it just evoked what the feeling of guiltiness felt like. And I had nothing to be guilty of, to quote Barbara Streisand and Barry Gibb. <laughs> There was nothing for me to feel guilty of, but it just connected. I just can't explain it. Anyway, such was the impact it had on me. I didn't want to go back to England. I literally had my uh, my my arms are br bridging the airplane door, not wanting to go back to England. It was that bad. And my father literally had to push me in. Such was the love I had for Jamaica and everything in it. But in 1981, it all changed, unbeknown to me. I remember walking in the living room by accident, it would seem, and I saw my dad crying. And I've never seen my dad cry, ever. I was 18 years old and I'd never seen my dad cry. My dad seen me cry many times when he would beat me for going out and sneaking out and going to blues dance and all them thing then, coming back late hours of the morning, climbing through the window and stuff like that. But I never saw my dad cry before. My dad was so resourceful you know, he could make a shed out of like three planks of wood. You know what I'm saying? He's just that kind of resourceful guy, man, human being. And um, it threw me. It threw me. But then after that, it was announced that we was going to Jamaica. We was emigrating to Jamaica. We was going to live out there for good. And we left in December 1981. We went to live at my uncle's house. Whilst the house that my dad was getting built, was getting built. But in between that time, my father fell ill. He actually had a stroke. But not knowing what a stroke was and not knowing the implication of my father's subsequent health. I thought it was just a quick in couple days in the hospital and come out. I just had that mentality. In the meantime, we lived as normal life as we could until one night in May where I got up one morning, I was around half past three, quarter to four in the morning, I woke up to get a glass of water from the kitchen. When I went into the kitchen, to get some water, I noticed that the door from the kitchen to the back garden was ajar. When I went to shut the door, the next thing I saw was the door burst open and a gun literally planted in my face. My natural reaction was to slam the door, run inside the bedroom, wake up my mum, wake up my sister and tell her that gunman was in the house by which time my mum was dazed, 
my sister was dazed and I saw one gunman come round the front, one gunman come round the back and there was two dumper trucks outside. And I remembered distinctly just saying to the gunman, take what you want, but spare our lives. I was 19 years old. And they took what they wanted. In fact, they took everything. They even took my father's medication. What the fuck would you want with my father's medication? But they took it and left us with nothing but our lives, as I asked. I remembered looking at my sister when that event happened and I don't think she, she's ever recovered from it because I remembered looking at her and she laid stiff as an iron board. It was like, it was like rigor mortis, but she was alive. If that makes any sense, it's like it's only her eyes moved. I'll never forget that. I will never forget that. And then I think it must have been um, the week after one of our neighbors who was a returnee wasn't fortunate with him retaining his life when he got robbed. He literally got shot in the face. And I remembered speaking to him, us speaking to him the week before he died. And he was one of the first people to, to lend his support. And the week after, gunman came into his yard, robbed him, shot him in the face. My mum was left with nothing apart from 800 Jamaican dollars. And my mum was deliberating whether to tell my dad. I had said, you can't. But my dad is her husband. I'm her child. So she told my dad. And a week later he died. The song Guiltiness came back to me because I felt so racked with guilt of not going to the hospital and just even telling my dad, Dad, I love you. Because I just thought he was going to be fine and he would come out. But what was he going to come out to? What was he going to come out to? So in a way, it was a blessing that he had passed in a weird way. Anyway, his funeral took place and I lost it. I lost it. I was inconsolable. After the funeral, I told my mum I couldn't stay in Jamaica because it was either I stay in Jamaica, end up in hospital, cemetery or jail or go back to the UK and restore some sanity. How? I don't know. But I had to do something. And like I said, she had 800 Jamaican dollars. And she gave me half of that. She gave me 400. And I had to more or less work in an abattoir to get the rest of the money to get my airfare. Literally killing cows, killing pigs, making corned beef, make, you know, making, making briskets of lamb and this and that and what have you. Watching pigs eat pigs' entrails and all these things, right? 
just so that I can get my money to get my airfare to go back to England. As soon as I raised enough, booked my ticket with my one bag of clothes and went back to the UK. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the first piece of trauma that I experienced in my life that's never left me. It's never left me. But there was more to come, of which I will tell you in another video. Because it's important for you to know of what has brought me to this point. And I know every man thinks his burden is the heaviest. And when the rain fall, it don't fall on one man's housetop. I get all of that. But I just want the preconceptions of who people think I am to just move one side such as the necessity of me making these videos. Because if I don't make these videos and let you know, I don't think I can sing again. And I'm being honest with you. So it's with that, I'm gonna bid you guys adieu for now. And I wanna thank you guys for watching. Thanks for stopping by. And as always, you done know the coup. People, please, please abstain from foolishness. And until I catch you with the next one, people, stay blessed. Magan.